Welcome to another issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. My special guest this week is Tristan Duke. This is actually a sequel. There were so many tools that Tristan had that we asked him to come back again for a second episode. Tristan, would you like to introduce yourselves to our watchers and listeners? Hi again. Uh, I'm Tristan Duke, uh, artist based in Los Angeles, California, and I do a lot of work with photography and optics, holography, and kind of inventing a lot of visual, interactive visual apparatuses. Yes, and um, that little introduction doesn't really um, do justice to the variety of things that um, Tristan has made, and there's a lot of um, craftsmanship and ingenuity and um what's the word i want um uh, uh excellence in the things that he makes uh, which are basically made by hand and um so he's on for a second round because uh in his work he's really uncovered some really cool tools that i haven't really heard about before so tristan tell us about um one of your your next tools yeah, so um, first tool I'm going to share today is uh, this little device. Uh, I'll hold it up for the camera, and for those who are listening, I'll describe this. So this is a it's a circle glass cutter, and um, it's basically a, a suction cup with a little lever to kind of activate the suction cup with uh, a compass arm and a swivel and a cutter a diamond uh, wheel that uh, cuts glass. So the way that this thing works is you have a sheet of glass and you would basically, uh, so here's a sheet of glass and you would basically just stick this suction cup on like this and then pivot this around while pushing down Like a regular and glass cutter. Like a re regular glass cutter. You can take this off and, you know, just like with a regular glass cutter, you have scribed this circle and I wasn't actually going to do a demonstration here, but I guess we can kind of start to show the basic idea. And then you would basically just start pushing uh, around and you can use um, like a towel or something and you can basically start, you start the crack and, you know, just like with a glass cutter, you can kind of tap around it. And then, you know, basically you work your way around pushing this crack and it's already going. And then you can slit the, the edges like that and, and free up that little piece of uh, round glass. So this allows you to cut circles out of glass. And I just wanted to share it's a really simple, basic tool. Most people know about, you know, the the normal straight glass cutters. And it might be something that a lot of people just never even thought of to look for or wonder about. There's no reason that you have to be limited to cutting just straight right. lines. Um, you can right. you can do this and it's very easy actually. Right. And the alternative is really hard. It's I mean, it's like if you don't have that, it's really tough to try yeah. to cut circle out of glass um, exactly if not impossible um and it, and it can open up some really nice uh possibilities like you know if you're doing a project where you want to have some kind of you know customized little uh viewing window or um gauge window or whatever you want uh this tool can really come in handy um this is a little outside the scope of the tool, but do you have a kind of a sense of when you would use acrylic versus glass? Because I've recently cut a piece of, of um, circles out, but I, I was, I, I took, I cut them out of acrylic. Yeah. And I'm yeah. wondering now I'm wondering, I should have made it out of glass and maybe. So, so what's your, <laughs> what's your guidance there? Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of depends on, on what your application is, right? Glass has some really great, um, you know, thermal properties that can handle higher heat, um, chemical, extreme chemical resistance. Um, 
it's uh you know so glass is a very robust material it's actually quite strong but brittle um so you know in some cases acrylic is the better choice for shatter proof and uh mm. you know that kind of thing um yeah okay um so that's uh, also, also just to say optically i don't know about acrylic but i know that glass actually has really good uv um blocking you right. know uv filtering properties which i don't know if acrylic uh has that built in right and, and glass is a little bit more ar archival in terms of uh its longevity because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know acrylic is a polycarbonate which can it has it can degrade more than glass can yeah it can yellow over time yeah. and right. i think also there's a i don't know about thermal coefficients of expansion for acrylic i would imagine that acrylic probably has uh more uh movement with mm -hmm. with temperature uh expansion and contraction than glass but yeah yeah so so these are all good to know so um, that anyway that's a circular glass cutter that's really and it's um one of those things also that will outlast you um, yeah very simple contraction yeah, i can't remember how much this costs but i think it was like eight dollars on amazon or something i mean there it's not an expensive tool super simple really accessible yeah right um that's a great one so tristan next up what's your second tool my second tool uh is this uh source for mini led uh stage light this light is really it's kind of uh the best light that i found in terms of versatility and flexibility so if you have, if you're not familiar with uh, stage lights, um, this light has all of the different kind of uh, functions of a full size stage light. But as you can see, it's very compact. Usually, right, these right. stage lights would be, you know, this long, um, right, right, huge right. things. Um, and this is an LED uh, model, so it's it's low temperature and um, and can be right, compact right. like this. The really cool. So some of the cool features, you can get different lenses for it. So you can adjust the the throw. I have a, a relatively long lens on here, but you can get wider ones or uh, tighter ones. And you can also focus. So notice, I don't know if you can see in the video there, it goes from being a sharp, hard edged uh, circle of light to a nice diffused uh, kind of soft uh, circle of light. Um, but beyond that, you can also use it as a framing projector. So it has these uh, steel blades, and you can see as I'm pushing them in, you can actually shape the beam of the light, in this case, into a square, for example. So if you want to make like a, a square of light, and obviously if you have this mounted to you know, a, a rail up on the ceiling, you could, you can imagine how you could perfectly frame, you know, some particular specific piece of wall text or something like that. But beyond that, um, you also have this little tray here, looks like this, and this, this holds what are called gobos. So you can see there's a little, uh, circle inside of there. Um, and so, so there's it's a little piece of metal slider that would slide into the side of it. And then inside that is another subset of different metal baffles that have different shapes that you can slide into. Exactly. That. Exactly. And so, you know, what I've done is I've just put a really small circle in so I can create a tiny circle of light. But to give you an even better idea, I'll just put in like a piece of... Um, you know, we could take, uh, for example, just, you know, like transparency like this and cut out a little piece of clear plastic. And we can insert that in. And I've just gone ahead and drawn on there a little smiley face, which you can mm -hmm. see. Um, so it's just a clear uh, transparency sheet. And if I insert that into the folder, <laughs> you can see, so yeah. you know, 
this is this just this is just the tip of the iceberg with what you could do with this. I mean, you could draw things, you could print things out, but you could this could also be a shape that's cut out of metal that acts as a you know a star shape. Right, or, right. Um, so you know, it really you can put gels in to color it. So it's just a very versatile, flexible light. Right, and the, and these these the larger versions of these were classic fixtures in Hollywood and theater, but they yeah, were. Yeah. In the old days, they were monstrous. They were huge because they were yes. hot and had to have fans. And um, and this, were, this, by I the way, know. is the premier company that makes those. They still make them, you know, in professional theater settings. Source 4 is one of the main manufacturers making those giant lights. These are, um, you know, just a, a smaller model that they've made. And right. by the way, this model that I'm showing comes in... Uh, in gallery white so you know uh the conventional is is the black colored right. one um but if you're using it in like an art context a museum context or a gallery these white ones are really nice because they really disappear up on the ceiling right right so this is for like yeah for sculpting or painting or architecting with light mm -hmm. when you have an exhibit say or a display or even photographically when you're trying to film something and you have to control light that would be part of your studio lighting yeah and and a, you know a real world example is you know when i was showing pieces at lacma and i you know they have 25 foot tall ceilings and i needed uh, a beam of light a spot of light that was exactly 10 inches in diameter to hit the top of a pedestal you can do that with with a light like this and there's really not many other lights that could do something like that Right, right. The control of light. That's fabulous. And and you say there's LEDs and I presume they could probably change the um the color temperature as well. Um well I think they do come in different temperatures. Yeah. They um they also, you know, are designed to work with, you know, yeah. Lee or Roscoe gel filters. So you can you can filter it that way. I should also say that they make the same light, the source for many with a halogen bulb um mm. i prefer the led one because it's just lower power cooler uh, yeah. you know you wouldn't want to put you know this uh transparency material yeah, yeah. in with a halogen bulb because they just get so hot yeah leds are the way to go yeah so thank you that's really great yeah um and, and what's the name of uh the, and again it's called a what so this is the source for mini LED. Four. Okay. Yeah. And that's the that's the brand. Yeah, e ETC is the it's the brand and it's called the Source 4 Mini. Okay, ETC yeah. is the brand. All right. Yeah. Okay, that's fabulous. So, um Tristan, what's another one? Okay, so my third tool of the day, uh I'm going to share another roll of tape. Last time Last episode, I shared a roll of tape. I don't know. I like tape. Uh, <laughs> I have a I have a huge drawer full of tape. I mean, you need you need a lot of different kinds of tape for different applications and different uh -huh. jobs. Um, and this uh, is um, it, this is the 3M425 uh, aluminum foil tape. And this tape is just it's one of 3M's most heavy duty robust aluminum foil tape uh you know if you've bought aluminum foil tape from the hardware store you know for ducting or whatever you kind of know the basic idea but this stuff is really tough it's uh it has this extremely sticky adhesive it mm -hmm. feels like it's almost gonna take your fingerprints off um and it's a, a really solid thick uh heavy metal and what I really like about this tape is that it comes in this extra wide six inch uh, roll size. Um, and this is a case where, you know, differences in degree become differences in kind. Like this, having this six inch wide versus just the standard turns this into a whole different material with different possibilities. Um, you know, it's it's highly flexible. It's flame resistant. It's chemical resistant. It's waterproof, um, and it can mold around. You know, you can shape it around things, 
and they use this on, you know, it's, it's designed to go on rooftops to like cover HVAC equipment and uh, shield things from UV degradation. So it's extremely robust. I mean, I've, I've uh, used this in applications where it's been outdoors for, you know, 10 years and that's in Southern California. So we don't get a ton of rain, but you know, getting beat on by the sun and it really holds up. Um, what would be what would be some of the use cases for a six inch wide? You're holding up this great big, <laughs> massive tape roll that, as as you said, six inches wide, and um, it's almost like a sheet, uh, and it's like really heavy due to tin foil that has glue on the other end of it that you can use like you could aluminum foil of kind of crimping and molding it, but it sticks. What what what, what are you using it for? What kinds of uh, applications? Yeah, so another great, you know, course, again, and people who listened to the last episode will know, I'm always concerned about making things light tight. So another really great property of this, unlike most any other tape you can think of, this stuff is really 100% light blocking, just one layer, and it's, you know, total blackout. Um, And so I've used this, for example, in custom cameras. So I've, I've built really large cameras in a lot of my work, including converting a giant shipping container into a camera, 20 foot long shipping container, or, uh, a, you know, a a camera that receives 42 inch by 30 foot rolls of paper, um, that, uh, I would carry around and take photos with. So I coded the outside of multiple cameras with this this uh tape and it forms this really robust almost aluminized shell uh that's totally light tight and waterproof and pretty robust to holding up to handling so yes so as as a kind of like a uh an outer coating for both durability and for light tightness i suppose you could also almost be structural in that sense I was just imagining making a camera out of foam core and then covering yeah. it with it. Um, and you have something that was probably pretty durable. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this, this stuff, you know, when it's used in like ducting application, I mean, it, it really holds, you know, uh, when it's, when you stick it onto metal, um, it can act as a real physical uh, structural hold. And is the uh, the outer surface is that just pure aluminum, or is there a plastic coat over it, or is it just uh, you know? I think metal? I I think it might have some you know almost invisible like plasticized layer. I'm not sure about that. It feels, I mean, it feels like aluminum, and the 3M spec sheets say that it's flame resistant. So. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. You know, that makes me think that it, maybe it is just pure aluminum on the outside. Oh, is, it, yeah, is, it, is it conductive? I guess it was another way. To yeah, it, it is conductive. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that could be another really interesting way to use it. I mean, you can print circuits out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's really great because I didn't know about that either. Um, um, so that is that like on Amazon, basically? I think you can get this on Amazon. Um I, I think I ordered this from Uline. Uline's okay. never the cheapest place to get things. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I would I would check Amazon. Um, That's really great. Okay. Um, so I think we have th- – that was your third one, right? Yeah. One more? Yeah. So, so the, the software that I'm going to share today is called uh, Grasshopper. And uh, what this is, is uh, a parametric uh, modeling software. Uh, so, Could you explain that, what that means? Yeah, so this takes a bit of like a paradigm shift. If, you're, if you've ever done any 3D modeling or you're used to working with 3D modeling, uh, you know, normally you would be, you know, selecting tools over here. So, so I should start by saying Grasshopper, is embedded inside of Rhino CAD. So Rhino is a 3D CAD modeling program. And ever since uh, Rhino 6, which was the last version, 
Grasshopper comes native as like a platform that you can launch inside of Rhino. Okay, um, so, so, so just to be clear, so you need to have Rhino to use exactly. Grasshopper. Exactly. If, if and, you and, if you and, get a subscription to Rhino or you try the free trial, um, I think they have a pretty generous free trial period. You will uh, you will automatically get Grasshopper. It's part of it now. They used to be kind of standalone. Grasshopper was like an extra plug-in for Rhino, but now mm. it's integral to the program. Okay. And so I, I just want to uh, go into this a little bit uh, gently because. Um, there are a whole bunch of um, 3D modeling softwares. There's Rhino. There's you know. There's Fusion 360. There's yeah. You know, there's the AutoCAD. There's Tinkercad. Where does Rhino fit into all those? Yeah. So some of those that you mentioned, like Fusion 360, is something that I use quite a bit. But um, what that's really great for is making parts. Um, you know, and it has what's, you know, and it has this, the kind of cam driver functions for being able to actually, you know, generate your G code to drive TNC machines and things like that. Rhino, my understanding is that a lot of, uh, the people using Rhino are in architecture and design. It's, a uh, and, um, so it's, it's less, uh, oriented towards the cam side of things. Um, but I actually honestly really did not like, uh, Rhino as a CAD software. I never used it until I discovered Grasshopper because Grasshopper is just a totally different paradigm. So, you know, in a normal 3d modeling software, we're used to the idea that you would go over to the side and you'd choose something like, let's generate a, a sphere. And then we would click on some point, somehow select a point and then generate a sphere, you know, and, and input, you know, drag out and create it or input its, uh, its values. And then we might start kind of treating it like a piece of clay and carving into it or removing things. Um, and we're essentially sculpting something like we would in the real world, right? We're, we're creating objects and we're combining them in different ways and we're acting upon them to sculpt something. In the case of um, Grasshopper, we have a totally different paradigm, which is um, we have this canvas on the right-hand side, which is where we have these different widgets. So uh, let's say we want to create a, a circle. Um, so we could create a circle from its radius and its center point. And essentially, uh, and if, for those of you who are listening, if anyone has ever used um, uh, Max M MXP or um, uh, what's what's the other one? Um, there is it's uh, uh, what is that other? Oh yeah, Pure Data. That's the other Pure Data. Um, you know, it has a very similar kind of visual programming language kind of interface. So you have uh, you have components that are connected by wires, and uh, essentially. Um, you know, we can, uh, so we can create a point. So you're, so, so as you're speaking, yeah. you're dragging down, it says circle. There's nothing circular about it. There's a little tiny. Yeah. 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 And it says circle on it. And then you say you're, you're, you're dragging these little, um, icons yeah, so, around yeah. that are linked. And so there's, there's, it's not visualizing what you're doing so far. But yeah, you're, exactly. you're, you're kind of building some kind of logic. So, sequence. yeah. So, so here I've just constructed a point and by default, you can see this widget has an X, a Y and a Z component. And you can see on my canvas here back in, uh, in the Rhino display, it has generated this little green dot. And by default, these points are all set to zero. So we've created a point at zero, zero, zero. And now I'm going to create. I'm going to say that that point is the center of my circle. So I just plugged the output from this point component into the center point of the circle component. And by default, the radius is, you know, one, but we could create a slider that says, you know, from one to 100. Okay. And we could now, uh, take this slider 
and mm. move it and we can we can adjust the size and so what we've done here is we've just created an extremely basic uh definition as they're called um so i'm just going to actually you know create a few more sliders here and um basically plug those into our x y and z so now we have this uh this definition where by moving these sliders around I can adjust where the circle is in X, Y, and Z space. And, uh, I can adjust the radius of that circle. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this, this may seem really basic, but what's really exciting is that now you can have the output of another function feeding into the radius of this. So let's, let's say you're designing, you know, a, um, you know, an architectural plan where you want to have uh, support columns in your blueprint every, you know, 20 feet. Uh, and you want the radius of those columns to be dependent on how many floors are above or, you know, whatever. You can create these extremely contingent uh, designs so that uh, it's instead of starting off with designing it one way and like we were talking about in the last segment, designing yourself into a corner mm. it's you you preserve the entire history of the construction of your document from beginning to end and you can go back to the very beginning and change a parameter and have all of the changes cascade uh from there so this gets really exciting um and it allows you to do things that you could never do um with conventional cad software so it's it's really good for either if you're as you say if you're making something that has to be adaptive or it's so complex that you don't know what the actual let's say um metrics or measurements are they're going to yeah. they're going to be influenced by what comes later so then you make something that can be yeah revised or continually revised um depending on the surroundings or the antecedents or whatever you're right. It's a completely different metaphor that I had not thought about, which is it's closer to programming yeah. than, it is, than it is to kind of, you know, visual drag and drop. It's, it's, it, you're actually programming the circle and programming the, you're scripting things. Exactly. It's exactly. A visual scripting language, I guess. So the project that I want to share, and we'll return to Grasshopper in just uh, a couple slides here, actually is my glacial optics project. So again, given the spirit of this show, uh, the projects that I'm sharing are projects that are really about the tools that I make uh, to make my work. Um, so I wanted to share uh, this series. So this project was all about making lenses out of ice. And in this case, I'm going to share some of the tools that I built to actually make lenses out of ice. So just to give some context, uh, this project started with me really thinking about glacier ice, which has some really unique properties. Um, glacier ice is, in fact, uh, under the right condition, it's considered to be the clearest substance um, uh, found in nature. And um, it can actually uh, be more clear even than diamond. Um, so here's, here's one of my prototype ice lenses. Um, and, uh, so this, this should look familiar for those of you who are viewing, but this is a screen showing the grasshopper interface. So where this process, where grasshopper came into this project was I needed to create the right curvatures for lenses made out of ice. And not surprisingly, there's no optics software out there readily available for making lenses out of ice. How do you calculate the refractive index? Um, you know, because every material bends light differently, you need to use a special refractive index for, uh, for ice. And in this case, what I actually did was I created, um, a, uh, essentially a ray tracing program and, uh, for generating, 
uh, lenses using Snell's law and the refractive index device. So back to what Kevin, you were saying a moment ago, absolutely, it is accurate to say that Grasshopper is very much like uh, a programming language for, um, you know, in this CAD space. So in this case, I actually was uh, creating essentially like a small custom program. And what you're seeing here, I'm showing uh, a, I'm using what's called an annealing solver uh, to actually generate optimized curvatures uh, for this ice lens while limiting spherical aberration. And so what this is showing is the program is actually running through a bunch of different permutations to find the curvature with the least amount of distortion and aberration. So that's, to, you know, to re loop back to Grasshopper, this gives you an example of how you can take uh, this visual programming language and really create a complicated, customized piece of software uh, to design um, something that you really couldn't do any other way. And, so, and like, one of the outputs in this case would be the, actually the curvature of the ice lens that you're trying to make. Exactly. Yeah, and, and I would have, you know, specialized inputs. For example, I could type in, I want a focal length of you know, a hundred millimeters and I want the ice lens to be, you know, 10, 10 millimeters in diameter. And I want its thickness to be this much. And I want, uh, you know, you'd say, you know, and I want a, it to be Plano concave, Plano convex or whatever kind of parameters you can program all of that into the software. Wow. And, you know, this is a case where, Obviously, this is not what this software was designed with the intention of doing. It's really a sort of an open slate. So that's why I say this. I don't want people listening to kind of think, oh, I don't really do 3D modeling. So this isn't for me. It's such a flexible uh, platform that it really kind of transcends even being a CAD program. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it, it, you're right. Uh, it, it's not just necessarily for 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 you know running your CAD machine or 3D printing it's yeah it's beyond that exactly I mean you could even use it if you wanted to just purely to you know as a as a calculator to generate values mm -hmm. you can upload files into it you can reference different data sets so it's pretty unlimited so what I'm showing here now is the finished uh, models uh, the finished uh, tools for forming ice. So the way that these ice molds work is they're heated and they actually uh, melt the ice into uh, the form of the lens. So you can see um, uh, I can create these these ice lenses and then hold them in these different uh, fixtures. Um, so here's a video showing one of the ice the formed ice lenses actually a time lapse of it melting inside yeah. one of the custom fixtures. Uh -huh. And so this is like an elastic fixture, uh, very much like the way that uh, you might see like a microphone suspended uh, yeah. between uh, elastic bands right. to uh -huh. limit vibration. In this case, the reason for this elastic is to uh, keep the ice lens sort of uh, pinned in, into the center of the optical axis, even as it melts and shrinks. And so you can see in the time lapse, even as it's shrinking, it stays held in place. Um, and what's really interesting is that the curvature of the lens is more or less uh, actually maintained even as it melts. So mm -hmm. um, it it continues yeah. to function as a lens even yeah. as it melts. That is um, unexpected. Wow. Yeah, that was one of the really unexpected treats uh, of, mm -hmm. you know, kind of discoveries along the way. This yeah. is a uh, more updated uh, lens holding fixture. And this is kind of a, a, a further development of that elastic idea. But in this case, it's a, a spiral of elastic. It's essentially a tube of elastic that if you twist this fixture, the the uh, they, it's kind of a nylon, almost like a nylon stocking type material that uh, as you twist the fixture, 
it clamps around the lens yeah, yeah, and actually, really cool. uh, you know, blocks light from coming around the lens, but still continues to hold it clamped in uh, the optical axis as it and, melts. And, and does, it does it self adjust as it's melting. Yeah. So, so the, yeah, exactly. It, it just wow. continues to cinch down around the lens. Wow. That as it is melts. so clever. That is and, really uh, so the, the, the video that I just showed here, um, is the large camera that I built for, uh, my trip to the Arctic. Um, so here it, you can see, I wanted to build something on a really large scale to kind of capture the scale of the glaciers. So the whole idea of the project was to try to take a portrait of the glacier through a lens made of its own ice. Um, and so this camera, it's a, it's a tent camera that is, uh, it's a four, uh, uh, four foot by eight foot footprint. Um, and I actually go inside of the camera to operate it. And this camera actually, um, it, uh, it receives a, um, a close to four foot by eight foot negative. So actually the photo behind me in my studio, that's a contact print. This is the actual size of the negative. Um, and here, here I was testing my uh, camera to kind of see how many air bubbles I could get away with uh, being in the ice and still get an image. Um, and what would so you use this film or the sensor? So in this case, I'm actually using a, uh, a paper negative. So it's uh, it's photo paper, very much like the photo right. paper that you would make prints out of. Right. Um, so I have huge rolls uh, of photo paper that I carried with me to the Arctic. Um, this is the ship that I sailed on. Um, so like, like 36 inches wide or something? They're uh, 42 inches wide uh, by about 8 feet, you know, 42 tall, 8 feet wide. Um and um, so last uh, April, I basically went sailing to the Arctic uh, in search of totally clear glacier ice, which I found. Um, and this was a real long shot because I didn't know if I would actually find ice clear enough to make my lenses out of. But uh, just to give you a sense of kind of the environment that we were in, um, you know, kind of sailing through these just like uh, glacial frozen environments. Um, and, you know, this, here, here we're scooping. This is actually a piece of burglet, a little piece of totally clear ice, which I'm going to form into an ice lens using my tools. And again, these work by heating and melting. So I'm using hot water in that bath to kind of heat up the metal bulbs and then form and then snapping it into the fixture. And isn't that beautiful? You can see here some of the kind of cloudiness of just kind of natural impurities in the ice. Um, cool. Yeah. So we're, we're, what they're, what you're showing is um, your big aperture cloth aperture that's holding this ice and there's a kind of a silver, square cube it's not cube but it's like a box like a tissue box yeah. shape um that's standing up that's made out of silver material and yeah. uh you were grabbing yeah, and and, and that's the tent that's the tent camera oh. and um you know this is kind of in the tradition of the uh camera obscura so you know you see the live image you know actually recorded inside of the tent um, so, and, be, um you know, and when you develop a paper, you get a negative. Exactly. And then I contact print that, that negative to actually create positives back in my studio. So, um, you know, you normally print, you have you, a you contact print it on another piece of, uh, photo paper. Exactly. And normally you would have a small negative of some sort, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 35 millimeter or something like that. And, um, you would, you know, use an enlarger to enlarge the print. In this case, no enlargement is necessary. Right. Uh, you just, uh, contact print it directly, right, right. uh, onto the, um, 
onto right. the, the the print paper. So the 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 first print acts as the negative film yeah. negative. When, when I was in Afghanistan, yeah. they um, the local street photographers used a similar method with their homemade view cameras, where they um, they would use paper as the negative. Exactly. Which they could um, develop right there in a little light proof box with with their their hands. And then they would take that while it was still wet and use that to make a contact print yeah. of, of and hand to you. Um, so it was all done right on the street with photo paper. Exactly. That's very similar to what I'm doing. And as you noted before, this is actually uh, one of the finished prints. Um, so you're, you're pointing to a very large mural on the back wall. It has it's a view of glaciers, a little bit kind of vignetted with dark um, areas on the side um, and lots of snow and ice. Yeah, yeah. So again, the basic idea was to try, try to create a portrait of the glacier, you know, through its own eyes, basically. Nice. Through his own yeah. eyes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Well, this is really fantastic, Tristan. I love this. It's so cool. I love your art. I love your tools. Um, thank you for sharing some of the ones that you use, some of your favorite ones. I'm sure there's even more. Um, but I love your ingenuity and your creativity. Thank you for um, sharing. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. And this exhibit, your camera lucida, is that what it's called? Um, the this, this is, so this project is called glacial optics. Um, glacial optics. So is okay. is that being exhibited anywhere right now? Um, I'm working on a show uh, for early 2024 that's going to be at Site Santa Fe. Um, okay. So that's that's coming up, and uh, hopefully more more uh, venues as well. I, I think I'm going to show some of this work in Berlin this summer. Um, hopefully something in California soon. And is this a project you're still doing or, is, or have you done most of the photo work and you're just preparing the exhibit versions? Uh, I, it's actually an ongoing project. So, um, you know, I, since I returned from the Arctic, I did a stint at the National Science Foundation ice core facility in Denver, where it's mm -hmm. the largest archive of ice cores in the world. Um, so I, I documented their lab and some of the climate science happening there through these ice lenses. And then I turned my ice lenses to document uh, forest fires, wildfires, and drought across the West. So that was kind of my fire and ice uh, wow. series. Um, and again, like the, the overarching idea is kind of using these melting glacier lenses yeah. as kind of a metaphor for climate. Um, sure, and, sure, sure, sure sort of thinking about the big picture. Um, so I wanted to kind of really tie this in that these climate events that we're having, these extreme wildfires uh -huh. and droughts, you know, viewing it through this literally melting glacier uh, lens um, kind of brings this uh, this other perspective. Yeah, that's it, no, it's really fantastic, incredibly appropriate, very clever, and um, I think really, really fantastic. Um, I'm not sure if you are, are the kind of artist who likes to share about what you're working on next or what's after this, but, um, if you have something to say about that, um, yeah, sure. Where do you uh, go from there? Yeah. The, well, the next horizons, I, I have my site set on, um, Antarctica. It's a little hard to get down there, but I would love to do something with Antarctica. And, um, also, um, uh, I want to uh, do something about California glaciers. Wow. Does California have glaciers? Yes, and they're they're melting really rapidly. Sorry, the okay. timer. I guess yeah, maybe. We're, the... we're in this situation where actually they expect that Lyle Glacier in Yosemite will be gone within the next two decades, something like that. Okay. All right. Wow. Yeah. Well, well done. Um, Thank you. Um, and uh, again, we appreciate your sharing your love of tools. Thanks for having me. This year, 
our Cool Tools blog will be 20 years old, which means we've been posting something new every day for 20 years. It's only possible because of the very engaged and knowledgeable readers and listeners like yourself. You've kept this place going, and we are very grateful for you. With this idea of 20 years in mind, um, we decided to try an experiment this year. And I'm inviting our guests and listeners to join me on our Cool Tool Show and Tell, which is the program that you're listening to right now. So if you feel you'd make a good guest on this podcast and have four uncommon tools that you'd like to share with us, um, please sign up on our form on the website and we'll see about inviting you. You must be comfortable taking on, talking on a video and um, you need to have some tools that you can show um, we record on, as you know, on Zoom. We do a YouTube version, a visual video version of it, as well as an audible version. Fill out the form if you're interested and um, list your four, four cool tools, and we'll see if there's a good fit. The applications aren't guaranteed in any way, um, and we're looking at tools that are new to us and appropriate tools and um, whether the times will work for you. So um, we're really interested in hearing from people all over the world, not just in the U.S., although the tools have to be available online, easily available online. And um, if you are a longtime listener, you kind of know what the definition of our tools are. They're very broad. They can be anything that's handy, from something in the kitchen to something used to travel to a workshop to something professional that we may not know about. We're really interested in things that we don't know anything about. So um, this is an open invitation. We'll give it a try. If you think you make a good guess for this podcast, um, fill out the form. There'll be a link somewhere on our website. Um, and we look forward to, to chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you.